all the way around. Yeah. Completely different different scenario. But I've also have the uh, of course Army Air Corps uh, uh, arguing with the Navy about and the Marines who did more of which and things like that. Fun. In One thing about you mentioned about the Merchant Marines, our second battalion that went from uh, southern uh, from Italy to southern France. Uh, all battalions on one ship, one of those converted President liners, and uh, they got to Marseille around uh, quarter to four, and they docked, uh, and it, but they wouldn't lower the ramp, and our battalion commander said, hey, how come? He says, oh, he says, we quit at four o'clock. We can't, no, we, we don't work after four o'clock. <laughs> it's quarter to four. So Colonel Handley, yeah, he's quite a guy, he says, well, I said, can my troops uh, crank it down? Well, go ahead if you want to. So they got troops and they cranked it down. The whole battalion, about 600 men, 700 men got off. <laughs> because the rest of the regiment was already, you know, 30 or 40 miles up the road. And he, wanted, he didn't want to get left behind one whole day. <laughs> so that's Merchant Marines. They didn't work after 4 o'clock. That's what, he, that's what he wrote in his book, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Union War. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even in combat, you know. Huh. Yeah. It's, um, it, now, you talked about transporting wounded back to the... To the um, aid station. Aid station. Did the aid station keep moving, or would the aid station stay for a while while the wine moved up? Or We would have, actually, maybe one main aid station called the rear, that's where the doctor was. Uh, then we also have a forward aid station, kind of a mobile station with about half a dozen men, you know, halfway in between the front lines and the, and the, and the rear aid station. And then we would have a collecting post up right behind the front lines where we kind of pick up the wounded here and there and put them there and the jeep would take them back to the forward aid station. And then from there they'd go back to the, uh, the rear aid station. So it's kind of a stepping stone. Uh, a kind of an expedient. Sometimes they only have one aid station. If the fighting is close, well, they're just, that, and they're protected while you keep them right there, so you won't have to have all the st steps along the way. So depending on the situation, uh, as to how far we have to haul them, because the longer we have to haul them, you know, the more energy you expend, and, and you know they have to get a, you know, have to get rest once in a while. Sometimes you know we work you know, 24, 36 hours at a stretch. You know, with no no rest, and uh, then you're always you're shot for about a day, you know. So we have to kind of rotate it around depending on the, uh, where the fighting is going on, the road network. Can we bring a jeep up? How far can the jeep go? And and that was all the means of transportation: a jeep and, and manpower. Did you stretcher them? Uh, in the movies, it's always you know the two medics come in, they put them on a stretcher, they get them out to wherever the jeep is. Is that how it was, or did you have to physically pick up these people? Or, well, it depends. Uh, sometimes they don't have uh, litter car carriers. You know? We have to make one out of poles, and uh, we take uh, two field jackets, you know, put the arms together, and, and make a litter out of that, or, or we fa uh, tie sticks across the pole and uh, put a canvas cover over it, a raincoat or something. We always didn't have litters, you know. You know, they're hard, you know, those things weigh about 30 pounds, 40 pounds, and, you know, you can't carry half a dozen of them on your shoulders, you know, <laughs> to take care of the wounded. If one litter team can carry one, you're doing good. And, and actually, if all the litters are going back, there's nothing up forward. So we have to have, you know, uh, every time somebody goes back, he has to bring back a litter. But most, sometimes they don't. And, and were the aid stations pretty extensive medical, or was that again just to stabilize them a little more, and then ship them off to somewhere else for? Well, back at the aid station, that's where we gave them blood plasma if they needed it, blood expander if they lost a lot of blood. They uh, they would re-splint if necessary. You know, they put a better splint on a, a shattered bone or arm or, or whatever. They would check the wound to make sure it's not bleeding. That's about it, you know, and get them out of there as fast as you can. The, the more people you have in the aid station, wounded, waiting for evacuation, the less mobile you're going to be. You know? If you have to move, you've got about 20 minutes to pack up and move. You know? So uh, you, know, you can't have a lot of people waiting around, So, especially when they're moving forward. If you're stable, like, you know, well, like in Vietnam, it's pretty well stabilized. Uh, Korea, they moved around quite a bit, but uh, 
uh, uh, uh, when we're when winning the war, so to speak, we're always moving forward. Yeah. And hopefully, if we have to move backwards, you know, we have to reverse the process. You know? <laughs> so quickly. And we, uh, but fortunately, we never had to do that. Uh, we never had to move back. You know. What are the again? I, my only view of this is from movies. What are the sounds? Do you remember sounds of war to you? Well, you know, uh, before the war in the movies, the sounds were very artificial. In combat, uh, they're completely different, and there are different sounds too, different type of sounds. You know, the, whether it's a, a machine pistol or a thirty caliber rifle or a machine gun or or a machine, uh, different artillery have different sounds, and and when they land, they make different sounds, and uh, you get used to them and tell what it is. Yeah, uh, like the German eighty eight was the most vicious uh, weapon I ever saw. You, you hear the you hear the the round land behind you or or side of you, just uh, well, right after that you hear the bang. In other words, the sound is is faster than the sound. Yeah, sound is what seven hundred seventy feet per second, sea level or something like that. Uh, you hear the bang bang. That's it. It's mean. Is it overpowering? I mean, is there just noise all the time when, when action's going on or is it where you actually can communicate voice wise on top of the yeah well actually uh, in the medical field uh, the only voices we hear is medic you know or hell or medic they hell they hell a medic and uh, then that word passes on uh, that's about the only verbal communication you know you need because instinctively you know what has to be done. Uh, if, a, if somebody's shooting at you from, from your right, well, you're going to go over to the left. Uh, or you, or you're gonna, if, you, if you're standing up, you're going to go down. <laughs> so you know, everything is instinctive. Uh, and the main thing is in the infantry, they know what they have to do, the objective. You take this hill, you take this valley, or you take this mountain, or take this town. And they know, and we have, in the medics, we follow the infantry, and uh, they more or less dictate uh, what has to be done. But we establish priorities on treatment, how they should be treated. You know? We take care of the, the living, you know? and those are those who have possibility of living. You know? That's our, our main uh, objective. What was the majority of the terrain like that you were in? Well, in Italy, it was uh, hills. Valleys, rivers, streams, uh, rolling up to the Arno River. And then beyond that, uh, I wasn't there. Uh, it was more mountains, but uh, below the Arno River, it was just hills, mountains. About it should probably not more than 100 and what 80 feet high sea level. 180, 100. Our first hill was Hill 140, kind of a popular hill that the Germans defended, and we took a lot of casualties on that hill. Even the 140 foot hill, you know. Uh, then in France, uh, it was a city town fighting, kind of a. We had to take the high ground uh, around this town, and then there was a there was a valley, and then then the Vosges Mountains spread for miles, you know, towards the German border, and that's what the, what the Germans defended. So that was all the mountain fighting in France. Now after I was captured, the unit moved down to Marseille area, uh, or to uh, Monaco area, uh, because they were so decimated that they were not a uh, fighting unit anymore. You know, some of the companies only had eight, ten men in it, out of a 200 men. Huh? So they couldn't uh, 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 fight without replacement. So they were sent back, and uh, of course I missed out on that part of the campaign because they were down, down the Riviera area. You know? <laughs> Could you see your enemy? I mean, were you close enough that you looked and you saw German soldiers, and or were they all kind of hidden? Well, as a medic, we really didn't look for them. Look for them. You know, we, uh, you know, we were looking for our own wounded, and where our troops were, that's where the wounded are going to be, is where our troops are. And Germans are pretty well uh, covered, and uh, they, uh, when they retreat, they, I'm sure they retreated in steps, you know. They leapfrogged each other, I'm sure. 
and uh, so uh, I didn't really get into uh, that close contact with the enemy, except uh, on one occasion we had a, uh, a truce that uh, I would pick up the wounded the next day, or the, the, the killed in action the next day, and uh, uh, I met the German soldiers, they came down and they talked to us, you know, because they wanted to tell us that they, that they captured one wounded officer, and they, and they were trying to tell my aid man how uh, they had to carry him, you know, they were showing him, and this aid man got excited, he thought he was being captured, he hollered for me, you know, I was treating a wounded in a ditch, uh, up, and I couldn't see him. He hollered at me. And I went up, here they were, there were about five or six Germans, armed Germans, you know, and our medic had about six, eight medics with me, and they were picking up the wounded from this one little firefight on the Arnold River. <laughs> and here's my, my litter bear, Sergeant, Sergeant Jack Yamashiro. He was hollering, help, help, help. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, the other Germans are talking to us, our troops. And so we picked up the wounded, and we, uh, but before we did, there was about a couple of two or three bodies there, and it was getting it was getting late in the afternoon. And I didn't want to come back for them, you know. So I told the Germans there, uh, what, it's at twelve o'clock tomorrow, we'll be back. And uh, uh, so they shook hands, you know, they we were buddies. But Jack Emerson was so scared. Oh, he thought he was going to be captured. Well, anyway, when we got back. I got called by the battalion commander, and he got called by the regimental commander, and wanted to know what happened. I was, I was declaring a truce, you know, so we couldn't fight between that point and next noon, because that's when we were going to pick up the, the wounded. And the regimental commander, uh, I think it was kind of peeved at me for the fact that you know, I couldn't bring the dead back at the same time. And I didn't want to stretch my luck, you know, so I said, I told him, I'll be back tomorrow at noon. You know, that's plenty of time. Uh, sure enough, but before we went back for the bodies, everybody volunteered to want to go back with me. Even our, even our resumeo chaplain, uh, Chaplain Yamada, he wanted to go. Uh, when he went, the Germans were there waiting for us. You know, I had a Red Cross flag. and There they are out in broad daylight waiting for us. And, and chaplain was... Happy said, me copy Laura, me copy Laura. So he's showing the Red Cross of the <laughs> insignia. He was trading souvenirs, you know, here's my button. He took a German badge. You know. <laughs> but we picked up the wounded, uh, dead bodies, and oh, I tell you, that was quite a, quite a fiasco. So in the middle of the war, it, now is that what the picture's from? The, 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 yeah, the, the big picture, yeah. So that was, you had basically negotiated a temporary truce. Yep, it lasted about, uh, oh, over, uh, what, uh, 15, 18 hours, you know. You, and you stopped the war. They, well, they can't fight in that area because otherwise the Germans there would say we broke the truce. So there's an commander, I think he kind of shook his head and said, what's going on? <laughs> because we were sending patrols back and forth all night long, you know, across the river. They were coming over our side, we were going to their side. That's why I didn't want to go back after it got dark. Because they'll stop, uh, I was going to bring the jeep up there and bring them back, but oh, because some of our jeeps were stopped in that area, and uh, no driver, you know, the jeep was running, and the driver was captured. So I uh, I didn't want that to happen to the medics, you know. And we just couldn't go with broad you know, headlights on to pick up the, uh, you know, the dead. I didn't want to do it, but I had to. Uh, and one of them was the company commander of the M Company, was killed. You know, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I can't understand. It never came out. The uh, executive officer, Major O'Connor, was standing where they retreated after this firefight. It was a patrol action. It was a patrol made up of our executive officer, Major, a captain, company commander of Heavy Weapons Company, and a platoon leader, second lieutenant, with about, uh, oh, I'd say, maybe eight or ten enlisted men. They went on a patrol on that day, you know. Uh, and uh, no fighting going on, so, and all of a sudden they were ambushed as they got near the dike, the Germans were waiting for them. They just mowed them down. And uh, this major was lucky, he didn't, get, he didn't get wounded. He was back there waiting for us, you know, to pick up the wounded. Now, what would. 
a field grade officer, a captain, and a lieutenant, you know, going on a patrol that didn't have flank guards or point out, you know, you know, uh, to, you know, they should have had somebody up on a dike and somebody behind them front and a point man. And apparently the, they were well hidden and they, uh, there was a lot of uh, hedge, not hedgerows, uh, vineyards, a lot of vineyards and a lot of protection there. So I guess they figured no, they were safe. Uh, but uh, it's uh, something that was never really written up why so many officers you know, were involved. And one got uh, you know, wounded and captured. And I just read an article here the other day where this officer was is buried in uh, one of the cemeteries in uh, in uh, in Italy and uh, the day of the uh, August 27th that's the day he was captured and he wasn't dead the Germans came down and told us he was wounded so you know <laughs> who am I going to believe <laughs> only the Germans know <laughs> now when you went and met with the Germans and the chaplain came were those German, a uh, German version of Red Cross, or were those just German soldiers? They were soldiers, yeah. They didn't have Red Cross. So you were like... They could have captured all of us. You were like American tourists going out to... to yeah. And the chaplain just wanted to come, and everybody wanted just to just come. Read, we raised the flag. Our side, they raised the flag, so we had to pick up the wounded, and the next day we were going to pick up the dead bodies. And uh, so our side was, you know... But Germans are armed, yeah. They but didn't they, have to. But yeah. the chaplain came just because they wanted to meet the Germans? Yeah, he wanted to, yeah, he just wanted to go, go with us. <laughs> now, I don't know uh, if he got the permission from our battalion commander or not, but apparently he did, you know, because uh, otherwise he wouldn't have asked me. Because, oh, it's my, and then a uh, whole bunch of other infantry guys, you know, they wanted to volunteer, they volunteered. So we, all right, drop your weapons off here, put your armband on, let's go. <laughs> I need all the help I could get. <laughs> so we mingled around for a while. They're trading souvenirs. Jesus, what the hell's going on? <laughs> so that's where there is that that absurdity to war. Yeah, yeah. on that one to one. Because here are you, now you have the human aspect of it, and uh, now it's not the enemy. It's this person I'm probably out changing cigarettes with and whatever else. You know, oh yeah, I'll change a you know. Uh, you know. Chap- the chaplain was even having a ball. You know, to me it was a very serious business. You know. I, they could have captured all of us, you know. They could have. We were not armed. Then uh, <laughs> when we got back, I guess the fighting started all over again. Huh. Uh, a... Now you did get captured, right? Pardon? You 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 later on ended up getting captured. Yeah, that's in France. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Did you get separated from? No. Uh, this is a very fluid situation in the Bojos Mountains. We had uh, 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 one battalion went over the mountains to a town called Bifontaine and captured that town, uh, or part of it, or most of it anyway, and it was backed by the mountains. And then our third battalion was on the other side. It was about, uh, oh, I'd say a good three and a half, maybe four miles away. And the second battalion was in reserve, I think. The hundredth battalion was in Bifontaine. The third battalion was on, on the, uh, that would be north and uh, west side of the mountains. At the same time, the 36th Division had one battalion about Two miles ahead of of uh, our hundredth battalion at Bifontaine, and they were cut off. And our battalion also was cut off to an extent that they could not evacuate their casualties, you know. And they're running out of ammunition and batteries for the radios, and uh, so they had a they had a, a, a party that came across the mountains to pick up the supplies, and they wanted help to evacuate casualties. So they called my battalion commander and wanted to know if they could have some medical help. So I had to be there, you know. With two medics and uh, one uh, one Caucasian medic who was helping us evacuate uh, the aid station, so I said, "Okay, we'll go." We took one litter. When it took us almost all day to cross this mountain because the Germans are, you know, in there too in that mountains, and we had to avoid the patrols. And we finally got there in late afternoon, it was getting dark. Uh, so it was a hell. We can't go across the mountain at dark, and besides. Four of us could carry only one litter, you know. Actually, you used to have about six or eight to carry the litter over the mountain. But there were four or five wounded, seriously wounded. There was three or four walking wounded. And I said, okay, we'll stay here tonight and decide what to do next morning. We can't. Uh, 
uh, carry it, and the infantry couldn't afford to help us carry the patient back. And during the night, we picked up two or three more casualties. You know, they got hit, bombarded, the outpost got hit, they had to bring it back, and there were litter cases, they were walking wounded. So actually, it was out of my hands, you know. I was helping this battalion, but I was a lieutenant, so, you know, as a senior medic there, I, I don't know what happened to their battalion commander and their uh, battalion surgeon and another battalion uh, medics, but uh, I only saw one aid man from their battalion, and uh, he was kind of working, coordinating the evacuation. They had about uh, 35 or 37 German prisoners that they captured. So they're going to go ahead and, uh, and let these German prisoners carry the litters. They had makeshift litters, they had uh, all kinds of contraptions that carry the litter cases. They had about six uh, wounded in litter, had about four or five walking wounded. Oh, okay, who's going to wash these German prisoners? Oh, we've got to have guards, infantry guards. So they had about three or four infantry guards, you know, two on each side of this column. And by the time the walking wounded with a litter, with the Red Cross flag up front, uh, going through the mountain with about six uh, litter cases, and then I had the four medics. We didn't have a job, see? All the German prisoners were carrying the litter cases. I said, okay, we're going to hang on the back because we might get into trouble. And if we get into trouble, well, you know, just hit the dirt and uh, stay there, you know, or run for cover. And uh, sure enough, about halfway back, we ran into a patrol of, a uh, big patrol, about 40 or 50 Germans, I think, uh, with a lieutenant, so it had to be a, a platoon, at least a platoon, or a small company. And we haggled. Now, I was I was way in the back. I couldn't see what's going on. We stopped. And there was an infantry lieutenant up front. Uh, he was wounded. He was a company commander of one of the companies. And there was a captain in a litter. And this captain rolled off the litter. And he walked by us, you know. <laughs> and this one German medic, Hey, Captain Kemp, he walked right by me and said, I took off. Where the hell are they going? Uh, that man in the litter is getting on and walking back. <laughs> so I went up and looked and hey, by God, a German soldier started coming up and they started disarming our guards, you know. We had about three or four uh, infantry guards. And our infantry guards were pulling, hey, you're not going to take a weapon for me. <laughs> <laughs> but they outnumbered us. You know, so finally, we became the litter bearers. The Germans helped us, you know, they helped to carry us. And I, I recall that the, the Germans who were helping us with the litters initially were mumbling to themselves, hey, war's not over for us yet, you no. Know? <laughs> I could tell that they were they're kind of just <laughs> mumbling, hey, hey gotta, what's going on? Hey, we, <laughs> We might still be <laughs> going back to Germany. So, <laughs> so it was kind of funny looking back on it. And one German non commissioned officer came around, took all the wristwatches away from everybody, huh? from all of us that were captured. And we started moving. And we kept going in the same direction. We were going, heading back towards our lines. And the German officer always looking at his compass, huh? looking around. And finally, I figured we were pretty close to our lines from the day before, you know, because our outpost is in the mountains. We were climbing a hill, a pretty steep hill. And we were just about the top of the hill when a, a German officer was down there with a compass and a Frenchman with a, with a wagon and a, and a horse or a mule came by and he stopped and said, they were talking, you know. And the German, uh, the Frenchman, he said, no, he said, and he pointed off different directions. Oh shit, we're, we're, we're done now, I figured. So sure enough, we had to come back down the hill, go back to different directions, off to a different angle. And do you know, about halfway back to German lines, we heard some shouting and somebody firing a weapon. 
And the Saturday was the American uh, GI's cuss word, cussing. He said, oh, what the hell? He was hollering at the somebody who fired this round. Uh, and that's where that lost battalion was. And, uh, of course, that's uh, about the last time that uh, you might say I was with you know, our, our group. I don't know how the, the 100th Battalion got through, but then I think our two battalions, battalions came through and uh, secured that area. And then they were tasked with the mission of rescuing this lost battalion. You know? That's how we suffered a lot of casualties. You know? and of course, I missed out on all that, all the big real action. And by that time, I was, uh, we were hiking back uh, behind the German lines hiking and riding on these charcoal trucks and uh, I recall the first uh, German interrogator he was he spoke perfect English he knew exactly who we were yeah we didn't have to tell him anything <laughs> yeah he's he's uh, he says okay uh, next, next. <laughs> And this one Caucasian man that was captured with us, he was helping us as a litter bearer. Uh, he was always interrogated first because they thought he was an officer, you know, all the white officers we had. But you know, the, the lieutenants, I just got commissioned about 30 days before, and we were sitting there inside the collar so it wouldn't show, you know, just the button show, everything was on the inside. And so I was all interrogated with the rest of the troops. But after about three or four or five days, they finally realized that I was an officer and they pulled me out. So they didn't want an officer with an enlisted man, see. The Germans are very strict about that. Officers don't you know, consort with an enlisted man, you know. They're separate. And uh, so I was put with other officers. And it took <coughs> us about another, oh God, let's see, almost uh, October, November, December. It took us uh, about two and a half months before we got back to Poland. Where the you know where the army officers were located, right in the middle of of uh, December, yeah. So you were a prisoner, and you were still moving for. Two oh and yeah, it's just every step of the way. Uh, at times, I was pulled out of our group because I was a medic to help uh, the, the the German POW camp uh, doctors. At one point. Uh, Stuttgart or Ludwigsburg? Uh, Ludwigsburg. They pulled me out and put me in with a with a medical group run by uh, the commanding officer was a British, an Australian in the British Army, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lassouf. You know, he called me in and wanted to know. I was a lieutenant in the Army Medical Department. You know, so he thought I was kind of some kind of a doctor. You know. He wanted me to work in the, uh, in, the uh, in the operating room, you know, you know, because there was nobody who who spoke English working with uh, uh, U.S. wounded POWs. I remember one uh, case. Uh, I was in the operating room, you know. I had no idea. They told me how to scrub, you know, and all that. And put on a, a clean clean coat, and, and I was supposed to stand over this wounded soldier. He was being operated on for a leg wound, and uh, they were going to put a, uh, yeah, they call it an extension, you know, so that it keeps the bone apart. Uh, and he looked at me, you know, and because they were drilling a hole through his leg, he screamed, said, "Don't take my leg off!" He looked at me, and said, no, "Don't let me, don't let him take my leg off." And that's all right. So I thought, "That's okay. I'm not going to take my leg off." And you know, he calmed down, because, but they thought he was going to take his leg off. They drill a hole through his leg, you know. Put a pin in it to keep it stretched out. You know? <laughs> and I remember that that kid. Oh, he was he was screaming, <laughs> but he, I was the only one that he could talk to. You know, <laughs> but they they realized that I wasn't much help there. You know, <laughs> so the next thing I know, I, <laughs> on the road again. I gave one case uh, on Thanksgiving afternoon and night. We were in a in Berlin, in the air raid shelter, a railroad station, about three or four floors down. We just kept going down and down. And all day and all night, that station was bombed, you know. We were supposed to leave the next morning, you know. 
Oh, God, we're not going to even get out of here. I said, that place is leveled. You know, we went up there the next morning. All this noise was going on. Bang, clang, bang. Thousands of women and old men and young boys with sledgehammers and picks and shovels are putting the railroad tracks back together again. The trains are running right on time. Yeah, we just got a train to call. Now, can you imagine? Of course, there, you know, looking back on it, uh, it's been reported that our bombers should not have bombed the centers, you know, because of the people are there to build it back up again. They should have bombed the bridges out in the middle of nowhere where there are no people to rebuild the bridge or tunnels, you know. But they kept bombing the main railroad station. Railroad depot, that's where all the activity is, that's where all the trains are. Well, hell, you get 10,000 local people out there with, uh, all you can see is miles. And they just had the railroad tracks all relayed, and the trains are running. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, one railroad station, I don't know where it was, uh, must have been somewhere near Poland, and uh, we were officers being escorted you know, to the officers' camp, about six of us, by two German guards, one NCO and one soldier. And we got to the station, and we were sitting in the corner all by ourselves. And all of a sudden, the train station started to fill up. And a lot of German soldiers were standing up. And one NCO, German NCO, was talking to our NCO, pointing to us. POWs, they're sitting down. And the RNCO was saying, oh, they're officers. The officers are POW. Oh, no, they're POW. We're sitting down. They haggled for about 15 minutes. And that RNCO, you know, stood up for us. Uh, and finally, he was outnumbered. You know. So then we had, we all stood up, standing up against the wall. And then the German uh, NCOs came and sat <laughs> where we were sitting, about four or five seats, you know. <laughs> you know. And, you know, our, our NCO had a duty. And one thing about the German army and the whole military system is that uh, they kept the officers separated from the enlisted men. The officers could not work, but the artists, enlisted people to the can work. Now, when you work, you get more to eat. Now, we were willing to work, you know, to get more food, but then, well, no, we had to live by the German military code that officers don't work, and that's their principle. If they saw us working, we would be degraded, you know, and we would lose face, so to speak. So we didn't work. But uh, uh, once in a while, the medics, we would get uh, uh, a privilege of uh, walking outside, just as a medical group, with the guards, you know, for a stroll around the country for about one hour. Well, in the middle of the winter, you know, all the, uh, the fields are cleared, except a lot of little tiny potatoes on the field. So we would run out there, the German guards would let us go out there and fill our pockets up with little tiny potatoes, you know. <laughs> when we got back to camp, we would share it with other guys, you know. But how, what do you do? You can't, you know, some guys ate them raw and they got diarrhea, you know, right away. Or we had to find a way to boil them, you know, or we had to concoct some kind of little container for boiling water. And we, we, we wasted more time and energy Boiling those little potatoes and the value of the potatoes. <laughs> Looking back on it, you know, it's, it's humorous, but you know, it, that was serious. You know, that was pretty serious stuff because we were getting about seven hundred to eight hundred calories a day. You know, wow. yeah, when one when a normal meal was about oh three thousand to five hundred calories, and one one uh, C ration box, you know, we got it was about three thousand over three thousand calories for hard working. Long shoreman, you know, keep him working for a whole day, but uh, we were down to bare nothing. And the only thing that saved us were Red Cross boxes. The Red Cross boxes came whenever the Germans decided to turn them loose. And uh, so every time we got a Red Cross box, everybody got sick all over again because they gorged themselves with all the heavy cream and uh, the corned beef and uh, butter. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but. We lost uh, lost a lot of weight. Only those guys who were heavy, you know, could afford to lose weight. But those guys who were skinny to begin with, you know, couldn't lose too much weight. And they, uh, you know, they 
they reduce their capacity to exercise you know, faster than the heavyweight guys. Where was the, the camp that you ended up? In? It was in po uh, Poland, called, a place called Schuben, a German name was Schuben. Uh, it was about uh, 60 miles north and uh, west of uh, Warsaw. So when the winter offensive started, though, we were one of the first groups to be evacuated our camp. You know, the Germans did not want us to be captured by the, uh, recaptured by the Russians for some reason. You know? yeah, so they moved us out in the middle of the winter. So where did they move you to then? Well, we just, we just kept moving, oh. hiking, yeah. Oh. yeah. Anywhere sort of 18 to 25 kilometers a day through snow. And we started off with over 1,400. And we ended up with about 400 uh, at, at Hamelburg. Middle, middle of the winter, we, get, we just kept, oh, maybe five, ten miles ahead of the Russians. You know? and the Germans knew exactly where they were, so as soon as they felt that we could stop, why well, we stopped there. So when you say you start out with 1,400 but ended up with 400, were people just they along the out, road? They dropped out. Uh, most of them made it back. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of uh, missing in action, you know, because we were parallel with uh, some of the. Uh, there was some police officers camp that evacuated along with us, and there were some other camps of old timers that were captured, and too old to march, and they were off the side of the road. They were dead. You could see the hands sticking out of the snow, you know, and uh, uh, well, we, well, that could happen to us if we didn't keep up. Huh? The Germans were running. You know, they were. There, all the transportation on the railroad trains were full of German soldiers, you know, and trucks. And we were out of both sides of the road, uh, just a mass evacuation. Do you speak any German? I learned some. Yeah. The Boston, the S's, Kartoffeln, <laughs> yeah, any, anything to eat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the rabbit? Uh, they had a lot of rabbits over there. The rabbit was a. Uh, Hassenpfeffer, huh? Hassenpfeffer? Brot, brot. Were you the only non-Caucasian prisoner? I was the only one. Well, we had, you know, that lieutenant that was wounded, was captured with it, and there was one other who was captured in Italy before us, and so there was one first lieutenant and a second lieutenant and me who were from the same outfit. But the first two days, those two guys were from Hawaii. They got along, and... Uh, they took off on the second day. They hid in the bank, uh, uh, not the bank, they hid in the uh, hayloft at the farm where we stayed that night. And they told me they're going to stay. You know? So you want to stay? Oh, hell, I'm going to stay with the main group. So I stayed with the main group. I stayed with the main group all the way through. Yeah, we ended up at Havelberg. Uh, oh, it took us about, uh, what, January 21st to April. Yeah. All the way. We, we, Kept going northwest because the Russians were moving more to the south of us, so we kept going northwest. Then we crossed the uh, uh, mouth of the Oder River at uh, uh, Schweinemund, Schweinemund, and do you know we crossed on a ferry and uh, there's a navy base there. Oh, but ships, submarines, and all kinds of of uh, navy craft. So how come there? You know, how come the bombers aren't bombed them, you know? Oh, well, we found out later that they're out of fuel, you know, so, you know, why can't, you know, why bomb a ship without any fuel? And here the Russians are right behind us. And it's neat, at this Navy camp, there's still people there, so we were able to use our barracks. And we had heat for the first time in about, oh, over a month. And there was some, there was some Navy, uh, young Navy uh, cadets there. And by God, you know that, Nine, ten, up twelve years old. They were saluting the officers. You know, they were strictly military. They just like nothing was happening. Geez, I think they didn't get out of there. Eh? You think they would abandon it? But uh, they were still there. And along the way, uh, one funny incident happened. <laughs> to me, I was the only one involved. We were right alongside of us, not more than you know, 50, 30, 40 feet apart. Thousands of Russian prisoners are moving. Uh, for, uh, they're all looking at me, and I was looking at them, and they're all Orientals. All Orientals. Uh, looking at me, I think they probably thought I, I escaped from their group, you know. 
But I found later there, you know, there are Mo Mongolian soldiers that are fighting for Russia. They got captured during the, you know, during the winter offensive, the winter before. And I looked at them, <laughs> they're looking at me. <laughs> uh, one more point, uh, uh, incident, about that same era, a period. This, there was another column of, uh, they were French, I think they are French uh, uh, enlisted men call, uh, walking alongside of us to our left. I was on the right hand side of our column. We were running oh, maybe eight or ten wide, you know, and three or four hundred deep. And this one French soldier came running through the crowd. He tapped me on his shoulder. Hey, he said, he pulled out a white whiskey flask. He opened the cap. Oh, have a sip. He, said, he took a sip. Here, I wasn't drinking all day, you know. So, so I acted like I took a sip and I got a mouthful. It burned all the way down. I, I put the cat back on and says, thank you. He says, yeah, thank you. He, he ran back to his column. Now, why did he pick me to give, a, give me a swig of his precious whiskey? Huh? <laughs> of course, I was the only one in the whole group that you know, looked different, I guess. <laughs> huh. That's pretty funny. How much, did you, how much do you think you weighed when you got done at the end of being a prisoner? Well... I got diarrhea towards the end and I uh, got sick and uh, I lost about 40 pounds, I figured. I was down to about 129 when I got back to Chicago uh, and I was up to about 160, you know, uh, uh, oh, in my par uh, peak, I guess. 155 was probably my best weight, but I was up to 160 and uh, down to about 129. So that's after about, you know, three weeks of eating good army food. You know? <laughs> wow, the the uh, um, so how when did you connect back up with the American troops? When and where did they find you? Well, that's another long story. <laughs> 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 well, at Hamburg, you know, we had that one escape attempt uh, by the tank uh, task force of uh, of uh, Patton's Third Army came and tried to liberate us. And they got through all right. They went about fifty five miles and through our lines and and uh, uh, tore the camp up, you know, and shot through the guard, liberated us. And there were about, uh, with the 400 of us that ended up uh, at Hamburg, uh, that we found another thousand officers from Battle of Bulge there. They were there. And when, I camp, when our uh, group took over the camp, why our senior officer t took over the 1,400 of us that were there, and when the tanks came, they thought they were only going to get about 250. You know? Tank, a company of tanks and company of armored infantry and uh, a couple of spotters. Well, hell, we couldn't get on because they suffered some casualties getting through to us. You know, they lost a couple of tanks and a couple of carriers. And so we all tried to climb out of the tanks. They said, "Get the hell off there! We're going to head back. We're going to get back." And so, but I was the medic, so I, I found the medic uh, half track and I back down there. He's, Oh, get out of here. Oh, it's not a medic. Okay, get on. So I got on with one lieutenant, and that lieutenant was supposed to man the machine gun on this tank. You know? and he was captured in North Africa, and he never handled a machine gun before. And we were stopped. Uh, by the time we got all loaded up, ready to go, you know, over 1,200 of them just took off, and some of them stayed there. But about, I'd say maybe 100 of us got on the tanks and half tracks to get back and and we started to go back, and then they got, lead tank got hit, and then we had to turn around, and, you know, trying to turn around a column of tanks, you know, you know how it is, a narrow road. Oh, we turned around, come back, got ambushed again, and both times the lieutenant was supposed to man the machine gun, never fired around, and he got chewed up by the wounded people that were in our tank, and shoot the fight that damn thing. <laughs> I felt sorry for the lieutenant. That was, that was the medic, so they couldn't chew me out. <laughs> but we finally found ourselves trapped, though. We couldn't go anywhere. And we were down to about one third of what we started with. And uh, so, me and uh, a guy by the name of Pops uh, and uh, another lieutenant decided to go back to camp. And we were about, oh, maybe two miles from camp, because we were going around in circles, you know, trying to get out. And when we were about halfway back, we met. Uh, two squads of of uh, German uh, anti-tank troops coming our way, you know, and oh, we were, we looked like a bunch of refugees, you know, 
<laughs> carrying sacks of this and walking around. And uh, they let us through. This one lieutenant who's captured in North Africa, he could speak German, you know, pretty good German. So he told him that night before we got involved in this and that, oh yeah, oh yeah, go on back. So, and about that time, we heard a rumbling of, of uh, tanks off to our, that would be uh, to the west. And they were coming towards the area where we left our group, you know. They were outside of a hill, you know. And next thing you know, we heard the firing going on. And it only lasted about half an hour, I think. Uh, they, were, they were done for. And that, that night, you know, we, we were back in camp. And the, the remnants of that group came back into our camp. So we were all back together again. <laughs> that uh, next day, though, boy, they hauled us out of there. And the Germans really secured that area because they knew that if a tank column like that could go 55 miles through their lines and all, well, there might be another, you know, armored division following them. But, uh, no, in Patton's book, he says the only mistake he made during the whole war was not to follow, he did not follow up that task force with a, uh, with a combat command, which meant one brigade of armored troops, you know, one third of a, or half of an armored division. And he could have secured the whole area. But what happened was that reading his book, you know, uh, and Eisenhower's book, they changed the boundary line between 3rd Army and the 7th Army. And his army is supposed to stay away from that area. But his chart shows an arrow <laughs> going towards Hamburg, about 50 miles outside of his border. Then all of a sudden, next day, the line was erased. They erased it. So there's no answer what happened to that task force. You know, this, they were gone. Uh, but then uh, I ended up at Nuremberg with the rest of the group. And uh, from there, our original group got kind of scattered. And I don't know how I happened to get scattered, but uh, I ended up with different groups. And that Nuremberg camp was a whole city by itself. It must have been 30 or 40,000 prisoners there. God, about half of them are, over half of them are uh, Russian prisoners. They were on one side of the camp, and all the non-Russians were on the other side. But we are split between Serbians, the French, the British, you know, you know uh, every, uh, uh, officers and enlisted men were also separated. But uh, I got in uh, with our U.S. group, and about, I would say, maybe about two weeks, three weeks before the war was over, the Germans decided to evacuate the camp except the Russians. And even then, you know, our columns started to move out, and the word got around that they're gonna, we're heading down towards the, uh, towards the Alps, you know, they're gonna hold us as hostages, you know, so. So, I felt that in the back of my head, I, I don't wanna be a POW any longer than necessary, so. The columns started to move out around seven o'clock in the morning, and around uh, 9 o'clock, we're still moving, so we had to take turns, you know. The, uh, the outfit way, the front, uh, way to the back went first, because I guess he got the, the earliest group, and we were the late group, so we tail end of the column. And uh, I looked to make sure I knew which way we were going. We crossed the bridge, uh, went, into the, went by the woods, and in about two hours out of Nuremberg, we were straight by our own planes. Because they saw this long column of people moving. I, I, they thought that it was German troops, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, getting out of the circle. They, they were just about in circle by that time. The only escape route was uh, to the south and the southeast. So uh, our planes came diving. And when the first plane came by, we scattered. And I ran as far as I could. And I went into a ditch. I was all alone. And then uh, after about 15 minutes, the German guards came running around, oh, like, back on the road, back on the road. So everybody got up, went back on the road. I stayed there. And when it got dark, you know, I, I, uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to go, go back to camp, towards camp anyway, because I knew that that would be a safe place and uh, <coughs> hide out somewhere. But before I did, I buried the knife and the fork and spoons that I had and some pictures that I had. And I put it in my uh, Prince Albert tobacco can and I buried it in this little ditch where a depression on the ground, like a, like a bomb crater, like, you know, I don't know what it was. And I, 
it got dark and I was stumbling around or I fell in ditches. And you know, I, I walked through German gun emplacements. I could hear Germans talking, you know. It, it, it all blacked out. I could hear them talking. It was about it was eight, uh, nine, ten o'clock at night. And I, I can tell because I look down and look up in the sky and I can see the antennas up there, you know, at a gun emplacement. And I crossed ditches and I, and I, I would taste the water because they had to have water if they're going to hide out for any period of time, and all, every bit of the water was real acid tasting, you know, like chemicals. So I walked all night, and uh, early morning it was still dark. I um, uh, found a place right across the POW camp we had left the day before. It was a stream there, kind of nice running creek, with clean water. So uh, uh, I had I fill up a canteen of water. I put two halves on tablets in it, shake it, you know, for thirty minutes, and I, then you can drink it. I was like drinking chlorine. You know? <laughs> but I had I had a half of a Red Cross box with me, so that should keep me for a couple of days. And that town was being bombed during the day and night. Now troops or artillery fire was going on. You could hear it bombing all night and all day. So yeah, it'd be a couple of days anyway. I waited and waited day and night, day and night. Hey. I started getting diarrhea, you know, <laughs> because, you know, drinking chlorine water and uh, eating out of rusty cans, you know. It's, uh... Anyway, after about, it was over a week, I think, I said, oh, i got to give up, so. And, oh, oh, and during the period of the bombing raids, the Germans would be running through the woods where I was staying, you know, hiding. The trees are about high as a roof because they're young trees, they're all in a row. I could look down and see them running all around me, you know. Jesus, they, <laughs> how come they, I, I don't know how they didn't step on me. But I walked out, broad daylight, oh hell, they're going to surround and capture me, you know. There were, the people are walking, bicycles going back and forth, they didn't look at me, you know. <laughs> I walked up to the gate about 200 yards, you know, when I walked out the road. There was a guard there. I said, let me in. I said, hey. It's been an increase of in Deutschland. What's the name of this? Get the officer. So he took off. He got somebody who could speak English. He looked at me, opened the gates. He said, you want to know what happened? Well, I told him, well, I left here about, you know, about you know, a week ago with that group, big group that went out. You remember that group? He said, well, says, I got sick and I got lost. And uh, yeah, he looked at me and said, he kind of shook his head. <laughs> he, he didn't quiz me, so he put me with, with a, uh, some more American officers uh, that were Air, uh, Air Corps officers. They got shot down, you know, around Nuremberg, they were there, about 25 or 30 of them. And uh, the dispensary that was handling uh, our group was run by Serbians. The Serbian uh, doctor and, uh, and a medical uh, administrative officer uh, who knew English, but he wanted me to help him. So I was the American, again, I was the American liaison between the Serbians and the, <laughs> and the, and the American uh, Air Corps pilots, you know. And you know how Air Corps pilots are, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty cocky, you know. <laughs> so he wanted me to be the buffer. <laughs> as a young, as a brand new lieutenant against captains, Army Air Corps pilots. <laughs> but I had fun, you know, and, about a day before we were liberated, a German doctor came through, or a German officer, I thought, uh, uh, and word got out that all able-bodied American officers will leave, you know, in, in first thing in the morning, out of here. So, uh, uh, the day before, uh, the day of a departure, this German doctor came around to check everybody in the dispensary who was sick. Well, the Serbian doctors uh, put me to bed and told the German doctor that uh, he's sick, Kronka you now. Uh, he's he can't uh, he can't go on a hike <laughs> today. <laughs> and sure enough, the German doctor came. He felt my brow, you know, it's kind of wet, it was kind of damp, you know. And I had, but it was diarrhea, you know. I, I probably had a little fever. Uh, so he said, All right. he went to the next guy, you know. And he picked up three or four guys that he felt that weren't sick enough, so he. He moved them out. Now we don't know to this day what happened to that group. Uh, they're mostly Air Corps, so uh, 
I guess they have their own uh, group, uh, POW group that, uh, you know, they call it the Stalag, uh, uh, Lufta, Luftwaffe. You know, the German Air Force took care of all the German officers and NCOs, yeah, German guards. So they have their own, own system. And I'm sure if we really researched it, we probably could have, you know, we got the dates and places, you know, and so uh, we could find out what happened to them, but nobody knows what happened to them. That's how I finally got liberated. So where did you ship back to then when they took you out of the... Well, to, uh, to New York, <laughs> from La Havre to New York. And, uh, and then from New York to, uh, uh, to Chicago, where my parents were. And here again, you know, I was probably a junior lieutenant. But there were over 800 uh, liberated prisoners from New York to Chicago on this long train, a whole night ride, and they put me in charge. <laughs> yeah, there was lieutenant colonels, majors and captains there, but I'm in charge of this dumb train, <laughs> full of 800 liberated prisoners. <laughs> and every train stop, they took off on both sides, you know, looking for whatever they could find, you know, Coca-Cola, milk, ice cream, or booze, or whatever, you know, they come back and load it down. How many failed to get back on? I don't know, but uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> I had this great big box of service records, you know. That was my job. So when we stopped in Chicago, there was an officer there. Says, I said, here, take these. Are yours. I don't want to. <laughs> How come they pick on junior lieutenants? <laughs> I had no idea what I was supposed to do. <coughs> this lieutenant colonel says, well, you better go check the mess, uh, mess car. What am I supposed to look for? I had no idea. So I walked in there. What am I looking for? <laughs> Those guys are hungry. They'll eat anything anyway, you know. <laughs> uh, that was my experience of liberation. <laughs> what, what was the worst part of World War II for you? The worst part of World War II? Well, actually... Uh, I would say uh, parts of Camp Shelby training where uh, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. As a first sergeant, I, I was a buffer between the senior doctor and, uh, and the enlisted men, and, and I had what I was supposed to do. I, I was supposed to be in charge of the morning report, keeping track of what they're supposed to be doing, making sure the NCOs are doing their job, and NCOs are doing their job. and It was just kind of jumbled mess. And the doctors didn't care, so you know, kind of. Why should I care? <laughs> no, that was a kind of a, a losing proposition. But when you know, I took a reduction and and took over a medical section in a battalion, which was much easier. No paperwork, no field, uh, very little field work, and and uh, I was kind of home free. So a lot of my problems went away, you know, when I took over. And when I went overseas, well, there's no problem. Now, that was kind of a problem as an enlisted man. Uh, as an officer, my uh, biggest problem, I think, was uh, uh, not having had any training how to be an officer. I only did by watching other officers, because they had you know, academy training, they had ROTC, they had you know, OCS, they had all the uh, schooling on how to do the administrative part as well as, uh, as a leader, you know. And here I am, uh, not a day of college, uh, not a day of officer training, and that was hard. So I was always about eh, four or five years behind, you know. And here I was, I was a contemporary, you know. I got promoted just about like they were, you know. Yet I was uh, always catching up. And that's part of the hardest part, you know. What, what was the best part of World War II for you? Best part, uh, I think best part is surviving. And do you know, uh, all during the period of combat, even as a POW, and not that I'm that religious, you know, I, I'm not that religious, uh, I didn't feel for a moment that my life was in danger. I had, I had no feeling of, uh, of, of, being wounded to the point where I'm going to be maimed or killed in action or whatever. But uh, I know that the longer you stay in combat, you know, the more 
chances are of, of living or getting older that diminishes, you know, uh, or increases. And uh, so I knew that something was going to happen, but I didn't know what. But there's a job to do. You focus your life, your, your whole mission on what you're supposed to be doing every day, every moment of your life, and, and uh, don't worry about what's going to happen to you. If it happens, it happens, you know. I've had people killed right in front of me, you know. You know, the whole head blown off, you know, and this sort of thing. Uh, it's, uh, you know, that, that round, if it was going a different direction, it would have been me, you know. But then I, I didn't feel that uh, it's going to happen to me because, uh, I, not that somebody was looking after me, but uh, that uh, they, I always felt that I was probably uh, a little too smart for my britches, you know. So I, uh, I, you know, I know what, what's, uh, what has to be done and how to do it and keep everybody happy, you know. So that was uh, uh, my whole feeling about the combat experience. And from that point on, you know, uh, in Korea and Vietnam, uh, it didn't bother me, you know. It didn't bother me, you Because know? <laughs> that, to have survived World War II, survived being a prisoner, and survived being a member of the 442nd, because some of the fighting at the 440, the most decorated people in the service of 442nd for what you face is, is a pretty incredible thing to, to have survived that. And, but to hear your perspective that you never really felt anything was going to happen to you. Well, you know, I've been thinking about that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the regiment, or the combat team, was formed uh, at some point in time to test the loyalty of the Japanese Americans, primarily in the United States. Now, the Hawaiian people are loyal and they're ultra loyal, you know, and uh, uh, I don't think they had too much concern about the Hawaiians. All at, at one point in time, the 100th Battalion was moved over here, uh, and they didn't know what to do with them, but they made a, a battalion out of them and shipped them to. North Africa and, and Salerno, and they proved themselves. And that was kind of a forerunner. So when we were formed, uh, after uh, uh, six months of combat, uh, they, were, they were kind of skeptical about how we would perform. Uh, they had, and so we had to prove that we could, uh, we could do what the job was supposed to be doing, like everybody else. There are millions, millions of people that were in the military, and uh, we were just one segment of it. But we were identified, you know, as a segregated unit. You know, uh, you know like the blacks had their segregated 92nd Division, and there's one more, 91st, one of the uh, 90 divisions. And uh, we had Caucasian officers. We had some, you know, they say officers, but uh, we had a handful of them uh, in, the, in our regiment. Uh, and we had to uh, prove that we could, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we were unique, you know, in that sense. So, you know, when we went to combat, the first week in combat, the, the Normandy D-Day was the same week, you know, 6th of June. And we were in the combat just about that time. So we were kind of forgotten for a moment there. But at the same time, the, uh, after we started uh, 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 campaign for about two weeks, the uh, the army uh, stars and stripes picked up uh, uh, Japs in combat in Europe, you know, this sort of thing, you know, uh, and then it says first wounded or first uh, decorations or whatever, and all that started to come up, and uh, and you know some of the officers in our unit did not we be uh, wanted to be in our unit initially because you know, they said uh, like a black unit. Uh, a lot of the officers did not want to be in a black unit in the same way, second gay unit. But anyway, after the first few weeks in combat, there were officers who wanted to get into our unit because we were being publicized. And then, of course, the media picked it up, you know, outside of the military media. And uh, a lot of, uh, not Ernie Pyle, but some of the other uh, uh, writers uh, came to our unit. And, and we got... Uh, in fact, uh, from my personal viewpoint, I got bothered by some of the people, media people, bothering one another, want us to stand around and take a picture, you know. What the hell? Here I am, you know, dragging out wounded and, and getting ready to go back out again. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to 
to, they want to be interviewed. Uh, it's a bull, you know. So uh, from that point of view, we got probably more publicity uh, than an average uh, regimental combat team, you know. Small unit, 5,500 uh, men at the most at one time. And uh, total, we had about 15,000 get involved in that unit because of the replacement factor. Uh, and we had, what, over 13 million men uh, in, in uniform at, uh, at the end of the war, you know. And we had over 15 million, million total involved in uniform during the war. Here we have 5,500 getting all this publicity. Now, there are a lot of units that say, well, you know, uh, over, over uh, publicity, over production or propaganda, you know, but, uh, but that's what the public wanted, I guess, to prove mm -hmm. that, you know, that here we were, uh, our ancestors were the enemy country, our fathers, you know, parents were, you know, the enemy, and here we were, uh, we look like the enemy, you know, and we, uh, names are like the enemy, so, you know, it's a, uh, it's a distinction that we got that uh, uh, the reputation, you know, we had to uphold it. We couldn't, we couldn't let anybody down, you know, not, not our parents or relatives or, you know, our country, for that matter. We had to, we had to prove ourselves. And for that reason, I think, I think some of the people who thrived went up to see my old boss that I used to work for, uh, Carl Wendolph, uh, Fred Wendolph, the Wendolph Motor Company in, in Portland. You know, I was I was a first lieutenant. I was making uh, uh, about hundred and seventy five dollars a month. You know, which is when I was working for him, I only made about sixty five dollars a month. And he says, "Well, I says, he says, well, if you get a chance to stay in, he says, stay in." <laughs> but but you know, uh, he says that. Oh, he said, do you know? He says, when you got your first decoration, the uh, the USO here at Portland got a case of of, uh, of Lucky Strike cigarettes, you know, to pass out to troops. He says everybody from Portland who got a decoration, they got a case of cigarettes, came to the USO. All the cigarettes they wanted, you know. And nobody told me that because all my friends were in camp, you know, or, or in the army. <laughs> what a funny thing to do. I mean, I mean, I understand it, but here you get decorated for what you're doing over here and to send a case of Lucky Strikes to the USO back home. Yeah, well, you see, whenever you're decorated, to say so-and-so, uh, home city, Portland, Oregon, or Sacramento, California, you know, and so that area gets, uh, the cigarette company, I guess, sends them a case of cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you're, and again, I know you didn't go in the service to get the decorations, but you are a fairly well-decorated person. You have... Take me through the list of from World War II. What you uh, well, actually, uh, uh, I got a silver star and, and uh, two bronze stars. Purple Heart, uh, POW medal. What else? I got one bronze star in Korea. Yeah. What does that mean to you, as a soldier? Well, you know. Uh, it's kind of a service record, I guess, you know, record service. You don't go out to get those things, you know. You don't go out to win on like a 100-yard dash, you know, in the Olympics. So you just, it's, it's something that uh, you don't go out to get. But whoever thinks you deserve it, you know, uh, uh, if he likes you, you know, he'll, he'll write you up. But if he doesn't like you, you know, I don't care what you do, you're not going to get it. And uh, that's, uh, I've seen some good men, combat soldiers, that were not decorated because they were goof-ups, you know. They caused trouble, you know, but in combat, they're top-notch, you know. They're wild, you know. But, but in, 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 in garrison situations, they'll go out. If they can't uh, fight somebody, they'll fight among themselves, you know. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, they're, they're real uh, super, you know, super uh, combat, you might call it. And uh, 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 most of them will get you know, the minimum decoration, but uh, they don't get the big one, you know. Uh, it's too bad, though, but uh, that's the way it is. You can't credit somebody you're working for, you know, 
you can't give him a promotion so he's always goofing up on you. You know, doesn't come to work, you know, or get drunk. Or, you're not going to promote him. <laughs> what, now, your mom and dad were still alive when you came home? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How proud of you were they when you came back and saw your mom and dad? And Well, I, my, my dad doesn't talk about it. Uh, my mother didn't say much. Uh, she prayed a lot, she says. Yeah, she, pray, she, was, she was an ardent Methodist, you know. Both of them, they became converted Methodists. And uh, they said, oh, they prayed a lot. And, and all of her friends prayed a lot, no? Uh, you know. They said, they, and they keep telling them after my mother and father are gone, their friends that are still living, they keep saying, your mother is this, your mother is that. You know, so, I don't know, but she never said that uh, when I came home. Yes, you know. She... Uh, my sister uh, was married to a soldier in San Antonio, you know, and, and she was sending them the blue star to put on a house in a window uh, for one soldier. My, when my brother joined, my, my, my mother proudly had two stars on her, you know, on her door. So, uh, they, you know, they were proud of the fact that we were, you know, just like, you know, everybody else. But initially, I'm sure uh, uh, they were kind of reluctant to, you know, to have anybody, uh, uh, in the army, uh, you know, my my f father wrote a book afterwards in Japanese, and I didn't, I couldn't read it, you know, because it was all in Japanese. But it was translated uh, by a Frenchman, by the way, a French diplomat in uh, in Japan. Uh, he translated, uh, in, and uh, I didn't realize it, but before the war started, uh, my father felt that. He should take the whole family back to Japan before the war because he figured that, you know, well, there's not much more he can do here, you know. But by that time, I was in the Army. So, so with me in the Army, he says he, uh, he, says that he couldn't leave uh, America. You know, that, America is our country. It's my kids' country. Uh, and, uh, could, so he, uh, he admitted that, you know, maybe it's best to go back to Japan with the whole family. Now, can you imagine if I wasn't in the Army? <laughs> huh? <laughs> what would I be? <laughs> Probably be buried somewhere in Saipan or, or Guadalcanal, you know. Or <laughs> wow. Isn't that funny? Yeah. What a, what a interesting twist of fate. Yeah. It's interesting, yeah, because I didn't know it, you know, that he wanted to, I don't think he told anybody, except in that book, you know. Yeah. <laughs> were you married when you were in the service? Or did no, you... we got married after we got back, yeah. Yeah. So you didn't have a girlfriend writing to you in the when you were a prisoner or anything like that. Oh yeah, so, yeah, we were uh, corresponding. Oh, you were. Yeah. Uh, what happened was that uh, when I was in Korea, you know, the, the war was just over, and the army wanted uh, regular army officers. Uh, they wanted to build up to fifty thousand regular army officers. They had they had about twenty five thousand regular army officers. They wanted to build up to fifty, and they were going to have an increment of nine, ten thousand every quarter or something like that. So I said, what the heck, I applied and, you know, took my physical, took my test. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I got two days off from work. <laughs> so when I came back, my tour in Korea was over, and I came back, and I was on terminal leave. I just, you know, uh, I, I got married before going to Korea. And so I was in Portland with, with my wife's uh, family, and I got a telegram saying, you've been accepted in the Army uh, Pharmacy Corps, which is a regular army of the Medical Administrative Corps. Here I am, not a day of work, and uh, they want me to be in the Pharmacy Corps. <laughs> so we talked it over, you know, says, well, I didn't have a job, no school, I you know, barely finishing high school, uh, no college wanted to take me, so if you want to go to college, you got about nine months wait. You know. So I said, okay, I says, might as well stay in. So I stayed in the regular army, yeah. You know, huh. And uh, uh, kept up with uh, with my with my uh, ratings and records, and uh, I got passed over a couple of times, you know. But uh, being a regular army, I got to stay in. If I was a reserve, I could have gotten kicked out, maybe <laughs> as a as a major, you know. Yeah. But uh, being a regular army, you got. You get second or third chances, you know. 
And I, I made friends <coughs> too along the way, and uh, that helped. Uh, yeah. Friends that counted. Uh, but if you, uh, I made some friends that didn't count. <laughs> and, and you retired in 1974 mm-hmm. as a lieutenant colonel. Yeah, as a colonel, yeah. Colonel. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, do, you know, a... do you know, I mean, there's a million colonels. That, do you know Bo Bergeron? Who? Uh, Bo Bergeron. Bergeron. He was a director of Veterans Affairs for a while. He came out from Louisiana. And... No, no. Here in the state of Washington? Yeah, he ended up retired in the state of Washington. Oh. And, and, uh, but, uh, but he was, he was uh, uh, just Vietnam. Oh, so, yeah. And I can't remember if he became colonel later or at, at what stage of the process. So, huh. Yeah, interesting. Oh, anyway, lady, I, uh, lady the head of the VA here at Olympia. Uh, uh, what's her name? Start with a G. Gibson, uh, Gibson, not Gibson. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of Colleen, but Colleen, I, but, Colleen Gilbert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Colleen Gilbert. Yeah, yeah she's a great person. Yeah, huh. so I, I met her a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, she seems very dedicated. Yeah, I think, uh, I think state of Washington probably. Uh, has a lot to do 